I used to roll back woods, rip the dawns, good wherever he goes. One million and one flows, deposit and dough. Said you down with the mafia family, let me know. Yeah, number one, I don't do number two. They watching how I do, because I'm really hood. Red hoodie, gold jewelry, too groovy, might lose me. Don't approach with the foolery, keep the two on me, homie. You don't know me, rip the dawn, the one and only. Yeah. It's your main man, Rick the Dawn. Hey, what's going on? Look, I got a really good episode for you today. I had to enlist the king of the drug game. All right, I had to go and enlist Freeway Rick Ross himself. This episode is called A New War on Drugs. We know about the old war on drugs, but this is the new war on drugs, and it is being perpetrated by none other than educated black Americans. We are here to uh, demystify this whole concept of being a drug dealer. We're trying to bring reality to the fiction because a lot of people, especially young, think that selling drugs is an option. It's not an option. And that is the biggest crime committed against the black community, giving us the perception that selling drugs is an option. It's not an option. So I, in, in, in doing this and in, in going after drugs and the whole perception of drug selling, I had to go and get the king of it, Freeway Rick Ross. There was not many people that could have this conversation with me. Freeway Rick Ross has dedicated over 20 years to the game. All right. So he has a lot of knowledge that I think is going to definitely serve this purpose. So without further ado, here is a conversation, a candid conversation between myself and Freeway Rick Ross. I'll be right back. It'll make you believe that the dope game is cool. But uh, at the end of the day, it's a trap. It's a trap. And that's where I want to really hone in on. So you've been called a criminal mastermind, an outlaw capitalist. Are you those titles? And if not, who is Freeway Rick Ross, the man? A uh, criminal mastermind? Eh, you know, uh, I, I did some crime. You know what I'm saying? I, I do try to think about everything that I do. But to say that I'm a mastermind, nah, or that I'm super smart, no, I don't think so. You know, uh, I believe that what I did, anybody could do if they're willing to make the sacrifices that, that that I was willing to make. And I sold drugs, you know, I sold drugs for eight years. But, you know, when when, when you look at it, eight years is a small uh, window in my life. You know, my life is, 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 it's broad. You know what I'm saying? I did 20 years in prison. Mm. So just compare eight years in the dope game to 20 years in prison, you know, it's really no comparison. You know, the time I did in prison in prison is way longer than the time I stayed in the dope game. So, uh, would I would I accept the title of, of being a, a a dope dealer? Nah, not really. You know, it's something that I did for a period of time, but I, I no longer classify myself as 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 a drug dealer. The second part of that question was, if not, then who is Freeway Rick Ross, the man? And the only reason I'm asking that question is because I want you to be able to set the record straight on who you are today. Well, you know, first of all, you know, I feel that 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 I'm a black man in America. And if if people really look at at our history in this country, everything that we know, we were taught, you know, they, they, they took away our language. They took away our names. They took away our parents. We, we were pretty much like a ball of clay that people took and molded into being whatever they wanted it to be. That's the first time. And I went to Malcolm X Academy. Um, you know, I, I fashion myself to be someone who cares about black America. That's the first time I've ever heard that that reference. Black Americans were a ball of clay and essentially they were molded to be whatever fit at the time for the people who were doing the molding. That's the first time. So you said that you wouldn't call yourself smart, wouldn't call yourself a genius, all these different things. I would like to push back on that because I've seen you in several clips, documentaries. And one thing I know for a fact, smart people do this, do this one thing that's very, very underrated. They don't talk a lot. 
A lot of times I saw you in documentaries and you were just just watching and observing. That is how I know that you're smart. And the second way I know that you're smart is because you told you told me you're not smart. I just want to let you know it doesn't work on me because I, I know you. I know you a little bit more more than you really. <laughs> so, uh, so let well, me. Go well, you know, I try to I try to be a thinking person. You know, when, whenever I I say something, because you know, so so often you can be talking to somebody and before you can finish the sentence, they start answering the question. You know. Bad, bad decision. You know, always listen carefully. Uh, uh, what I found out when I was in the pen is that listening is 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 an art. You know, it's, and it's a lost art because most people can't listen because they're so busy wanting to do the talking. So, you know, I've learned that first understand and then be understood. And I noticed something else you do when you're listening, your eyes are always going side to side. You probably don't realize this stuff I picked up just watching and observing. So like you always scanning and looking at a certain thing. I just kind of pick that up. And also to kind of go back on what you just pointed out, I think that's why God gave us one mouth, two eyes, two ears. You know, you're supposed to look and listen twice as much as you talk. And I think that goes unseen. A lot of these guys, they do more talking as if they got two mouths, one ear, one eye. But I want to keep it, you know what I'm saying? Check this out. So can you expand on your comments about how you once felt that you were born to be a drug dealer? And also having matured, what is your purpose currently? Like you you talked about your purpose. At one point you felt like your purpose was to be a drug dealer. And I want to kind of contrast that with what you feel your purpose is now. Well, you know, when 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 you lost, you know what I'm saying? You you can be a gang member. You know, when you confuse, you can say that you're a drug dealer. You know, when you confuse, you can be a prostitute. When when you confuse and lost, you can put your sister on the street to sell herself. You'll sell dope to your mama, to your brother. I believe that all of those are states of confusion, uh, unaware, not understanding, not really knowing who you are and what your true potential is, you know, having low self-esteem. Anybody can can go out and take fifty dollars, make the right moves with drugs, and become a drug kingpin where they making two million, three million dollars a day. That 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 does not take a whole lot of brains. You know, all that took was not getting high. And some of these steps go even with life itself. You know what I'm saying? Like if you want to be successful in any business, you shouldn't be getting high. You know, <laughs> I mean getting high gonna fuck up down in any business you go into. I don't care if you're driving trucks, okay. flying airplanes, fixing houses, if you're getting high. It's going to wind up affecting your work ethic, the amount of money you're putting into the project. You know, you, you're going to start cutting corners. Just the nature of, of getting high. You know, you're not going to go to work on time. So getting high in any line of work that you're going in should be the first thing that you don't do. Not getting drunk, you know, smoking cigarettes, overeating. I mean, there's just so many little variables that we can do that can hinder us from our true potential. Now, God put you on a really interesting course. I have to ask, what is your purpose on this earth? What do you think you were put here to do? And why do you think you went through that particular life arc to be where you are right now? What, you, what do you have to get? What is, what is the story? What is the meaning behind that life? Because that's a life that a lot of people won't live in a hundred years. Well, I, I think now that my purpose is to help the people who has been treated the worst in this country uh, gain economical power. Because in, in my opinion, us as black people, our problem is not that we're evil people, that we're crooks, that we're thieves, that we're pimps, that we're pros, that we're dope dealers. Most of our problems center around economics. I don't believe that our problems center around us being bad people or dumb people. Our problem center around is resources. We don't have the resources to accomplish the goals that we want to accomplish. A man that can't take care of his family, he doesn't feel like he's a man. So he'll do whatever in order to get that feeling of being a man because he wants to be a man. That's his nature is to be a man, is to be a provider, to, to, to take care of his kids, to take care of his family. And when you no longer can do those things, then you're not sane anymore. You're not functioning at your highest level and you're willing to stoop down and do some things that may be beneath you. You know, in order to try to get that feeling that 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 you're looking for. That's interesting. You talk about resources, and I think Black Americans do have resources. You know, we got a lot of millionaires and people with a lot of money, but they don't have the intellect to use those resources. They are, they'll rather go buy jewelry 
than buy a business or buy a, a whatever. So it's almost funny. It's like we do have the resources, but I don't think we have the mental or intellectual resources to actually deal yeah, with money. You know what I mean? Even the people who are millionaires, it's not that many of them in this country. Mm -hmm. It's not that many black millionaires. I mean, yeah, we got we, we might have maybe 500, maybe 1,000. That's still not that many, though. That's still a small number to the, the amount of millionaires that are in this country. And then most of our millionaires got to be millionaires with, with somebody with strings attached to them. My man Kyrie Irving is a perfect example, you know, and, and I, I love the guy, you know, and I love what he, what he stand for. And, and I think what they did to him was, was totally was wrong. You know what I'm saying? No, they've been, I never come tell me what I can't tweet and what I can't say on, on, on no thing. But if you are working for somebody else and your income is tied to them approving you, mm -hmm. then you can have those type of situations. And most of our millionaires in this country, they got their millions through that system. You know, now drug dealers, on the other hand, they don't really have anything tied to them. The system is so hard on drug dealers because they come up with a different mentality. The streets made them uh, not Universal, not Warner Brothers, not the NFL, not the NBA or, or the National Baseball League. None of those made these guys so they can't take their wealth from them. You, the FBI can and the DEA can, but. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! It's getting hot in here. All right, it's getting hot. So before I show you the conclusion of this amazing conversation between myself and Freeway Rick Ross, I want to give you a little time to, you know, digest and reflect about what's, what's going on, the gravity of what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to demystify this whole perception of drug dealing. I'm trying to change lives. I want black men and women to realize they have a plethora of different options. But before we get into the conclusion, check out this track and I'll be right back. Hey kids, I got a story for you. It's about a young man who grows up in the inner city of Detroit and he has to navigate all the traps. It goes like this. Picture a scrawny kid in a math class. He struggles with algebra with his dumb aspirations to be greater than most though. Never so dope, you can catch him in cheap clothes. Like to play ball outside, but was last picked. On second thought, he was never picked. He played defense. Imaginary friends, he would rap to them walking home. He passed a group of girls who he thought looked quite grown. They were loudly cheering, trying to get his attention. But he was so afraid, didn't pay them attention. They waved him off, got mad, cursed them out as they left. He didn't fret them girls because mama was best. Fly soon, boy, cocoon. One day you'll fly, one day real soon. Stay safe, young boy, in your cocoon. Grow trees, fly, be. One day you'll grow way past the trees and be a beautiful butterfly, high as can be. Now picture that same kid from the math class. He's gotten older, peach fuzz and a few abs. He's changed his swag, often joking in a high school class. Jay's on his toes, he used those to attract the hoes in this throwback Michael Jordan jersey. The girls were always jocking, some of them called him Hershey. A chocolate thunder, a sexy chocolate didn't matter. He started selling candy, only made his wallet fatter. It gets blurry thereafter, but I think he started smoking and began pushing. And crack, you can say that he was open. He learned lots of lessons, even almost went to jail and kept a firearm because he was scared as hell. Fly soon, boy, cocoon. One day you'll fly, one day real soon. Stay safe, young boy, in your cocoon. Grow trees, fly. One day you'll grow way past the trees and be a beautiful butterfly, high as can be. That same young man that songs the hood, he understood the game, it all was changed up his ways. A genius leaves the block, you bet he's on his way. If he didn't change his path, he'd be dead today. 
packed all his things and went the college route like screw jail all the honeys go the college route he was right he was seeing ladies left and right what a sight butterfly spread your wings tonight but anyway off topic he saw through college like a rocket dude made his mama proud he could feel her looking down see she died two years prior due to cancer that almost wrecked his world he kneeled and prayed for answers and heard fly soon boy cocoon one day you'll fly one day real soon stay safe young boy in your cocoon bro trees fly be one day you'll grow way past the trees and be a beautiful butterfly high as can be all right kids that's the end of my story i really hope you enjoyed it you too can be somebody and don't worry that kid i was talking about he went on to live happily ever after i hope you enjoyed that track now it's time for the grand conclusion of the conversation between myself and freeway rick ross Look, we're here to bring reality to this lie that selling drugs is fun and that it's cool. It's not. It comes with real consequences. So hold on to your seat as we finish this massive and major conversation. Well, I want to move to this next question. I'm, I'm, I wanted to ask you this because I know you are one of the very few people who can give me the best answer. Let's get to the root of the issue. How did crack enter black neighborhoods? Well, when I heard about it, it was it was really just really high level blacks that was doing it when I first started. You know, the Richard Pryors, the Don Caniuses, mostly entertainers, lawyers and doctors. So it was really, really uh, uh, an elite drug. My goal when I got into it, and this is me being brainwashed and thinking that what I was bringing was a piece of Hollywood to the hood. You know, mm. cause I want to be a, I wanted to be a part of Hollywood. You know, mm. I wanted to be like Rick James. I'm. I wanted to be like Don. I wanted to go on Soul Train. You know what I'm saying? All them fine women on there dancing and, and, and you know, robotting with them naturals and, right. you know, dressed in the finest of clothes. That that impressed me. So I wanted a part of that world. And when I got a piece of it, I thought that I was bringing that back to the hood, not understanding that that part of, of Hollywood was detrimental to, to our health. What goes through your mind the moment you get caught and arrested? And the reason I ask that question, because I'm talking to somebody who might be on the verge of going down one, one road or another. And I want them to seriously consider the ramifications of this lifestyle because it's not glamorous. It's not what we see in these rap videos and what these rappers are talking about. So if you can just paint the picture for the person who needs to hear it, what goes through your mind the moment you're caught and arrested for dealing drugs? Well, you know, when I, when I first got arrested, I, I thought I might be looking at like 10 years. You know, I could I could justify myself doing 10 years. You know, I was still young. I was 28 years old at the time. And I was like, you know, I get 10 years. You do 85 percent of it. I wind up doing eight years. So I'd be coming home at 30 something years old. But when I got to the, to the jail and I found out that for a few grams of rock cocaine, you could get a life sentence without the possibility of parole was a whole nother ball game that put fear into my heart. You know, now I was looking at a situation where, you know, you, you may never be able to see your mama free again or you may never be able to hold your grandkids or, you know, go to school and, and pick your kids up from school. So all those things start going through my mind. And, and it was a little terrifying. On that same note, jail is often glorified for reasons I cannot understand. For those people who glorify it, let's let's bring some truth to it. Can you walk us through the worst day or your worst day in the pen? Well, you know, your, your first day is always your worst day. When you leave the streets, you know, you're eating whatever you want to eat. You, you turn your lights out when you want to. You got, you know, a big leg girl laying up in the bed with you. Mm. And uh, when you get to jail, you know, your mattress is going to probably be about two inches thick. You're going to have a pillow with plastic on it. Might smell a little bit, you know, not a whole lot. But, you know, they put some bleach on it, but it still might have a little odor to it. Uh, they're going to put you in a cell that's about five feet by maybe 12. You're going to probably have a celly. Hopefully your celly takes showers. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Uh, you have a steel toilet with, with a sink attached to it, and they'll probably give you a little bitty toothbrush with, with a few brussels in it and uh, a little bitty toothpaste that they get from uh, uh, the dollar store, I guess. It's not, it's not a pleasant 
uh, a situation when you come from, you know, staying in fine hotels, eating the finest foods, you know, where you go into restaurants and you tip in three, four hundred dollars to the waiters. Now you got to go to the store and you can only spend three hundred dollars for the whole month. Then they tell you your phone, you know, uh, uh, you know, I hear you get unlimited minutes in there. You only get 300 minutes a month. And at that time, when I first went, a phone call was like 75 cents a minute. So so they taxing you on the phone calls. It ain't cool. I don't know who think it's cool because you ain't going to have no woman in there. You know, that cool. that's not cool at all. When they told me I couldn't have no woman, I, I, I was crushed. But I'll be honest with you. I did not expect you to say the first day. And it makes the it makes the most sense because by that point, you was touching a lot of money and you. Like you said, living in hotels and things like that, the first day would be the most traumatic. But I want to ask you another question, uh, because our children, black American children, are often at oversight. We don't really pay enough attention to them. So I want to ask you this. How did childhood traumas like seeing the death of your Uncle George at five years old affect your your uh, overall, you know, or your decision, rather, to go into drug dealing? How did those type of traumas affect that? Well, well, I don't know if he if, if it affected me about going into the drug business. But one of the things that I did know is that whenever I saw a, a, a dramatic incident, I would always go back to the day that my uncle was gasping for his breath, you know, for the last time. Going into the drug business for me was more on trying to escape poverty. You know, I, I was I was running from poverty. You know, my mom was on welfare. She took in a couple of my, my cousins. And she didn't have the money to do it, you know. So we had broken windows in the house. We had rats and roaches and, you know, holes in the floor. And sometimes it wouldn't be enough food. You know, we didn't have the lights cut out. I, I said that I never wanted to see her go through it. And, and I didn't want to see my siblings have to eat sugar syrups and biscuits. Mm. So, yeah, and it's interesting because gun violence is only one type of trauma, but you just touched on a whole different one. Not having food, malnutrition. And as you just pointed out, those scenarios forced you into the game. It doesn't sound like you got into the game to just be glorified or what have you. It was like it was out of desperation. That's what it sounded like. As you uh, continue to pursue tennis, honestly, where do you think you'd be at at this very second? You know, with the tennis, I needed some some assistance. You know, I, I didn't really understand what it took to to become great. I didn't understand greatness at the time. In order to understand greatness, you have to have somebody around you that had, has once upon a time been great. Uh, when I started selling drugs, money bought greatness around me, if, if that makes sense. People who wouldn't associate with me when I was broke, now that I had money, started to associate themselves with me. They started to give me advice and and give me information. It's funny, you know, when, when I was in the pen, I read a book and it talked about how if you wanted information, you had to pay for it. Say, for instance, if, if you wanted to know how to build a house, you can go buy a book that will teach you how, or you can go hire, hire a contractor, pay him, and he'll teach you how to do it. Information is, is not necessarily free. You know, we used to joke about it all the time, Game is to be sold, not told. And 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 little did did I know what they meant. But now I know exactly what they mean. Is that if you want to get some game, then you got to pay for it. And the more money you have, the more game people will give you. And now it's funny because the internet has made a lot of information free, but you're still paying with your time. You know what I mean? But I want to ask you this: How did you successfully avoid joining a gang or crew, especially being in the gang capital? How did you do that? Well, you know, I, I, I grew up in, in Hoover Crip Hood. You know, at that time, they was the biggest gang in, in, in Los Angeles. And by me going to school with them, and these were like my brothers, you know, we, we were tight. So they couldn't force me to do anything. You know, they wasn't going to fight me because I didn't get in the gang. And, you know, I had a pretty good fight game, too. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I could do a little bit with myself. But it wasn't to the point in L.A. where they would force you in at that time. It, it was more about the peer pressure. And fortunate for me, when I was 12, 12 and a half, somebody put a tennis racket in my hand and, and I fell in love with tennis instead of falling in love with the guns. But some of my homeboys who I went to elementary school with and junior high school with, now they actually joined uh, the gangs and went to jail at 18 years old. And they just been getting out over the last three or four years. All right, let's end things right here. I hope that if nothing else, I brought clarity to somebody who's struggling with this whole concept of selling drugs. Look, Freeway Rick Ross at one point was bringing in 
one million dollars per day we can say that he is one of the most successful drug dealers of all time 99 percent of hustlers on this earth will never see those type of funds or hustle to that magnitude if he reached the top and came back down i don't think that you have a chance so i hope that you take this episode as a warning and i hope this episode helped bring reality and clarity to a topic that i think is just being <laughs> misused and glossed over that is what i have for you find something more constructive to do and forget about this whole fantasy of fun drug dealing it does not exist with that being said god bless you be safe and i see you on the next one peace